Welcome to another fun-filled edition of Second City Sports Zoom Style. Zoom Style. <laughs> Along with Lakeena McGee, I am Sydney Brown. You can follow yours truly on the Twitter in the IG at CK80. Once again, at CK80, that's S-I-D-K-I-D-8-0. That's S-I-D-K-I-D-8-0. You can follow me at Keena McGee on Twitter and Keena underscore McGee on the IG. You can follow this podcast, Second City Sports, along with the other podcast programming from We Are Regal Radio by first going to our website at www.wearegalradio.com. That's W-E-A-R-E-R-E-G-A-L radio.com. And you can, follow, you can get all of our podcast programming by simply typing in War on Anchor. That's W-A-R-R on Anchor, wherever you download your podcast, including the iHeartRadio app. We're also on YouTube at War Media. Once again, at W-A-R-R Media. You can not only listen to us, but watch us do our thing. Look alive! Like, share, subscribe, and yes. tell all your friends. Yes, and before we get started, we are recording this on the Monday, as you, many of you well know, and this is um, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther, Luther, Luther King Jr. Uh, holiday. His birthday was a couple of days ago. He would have been 92 years old, so we want to dedicate this show to the memory of the late great Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. We are honoring him uh, with this show today. And so we pay homage to him and to the, all the other civil rights leaders of the past and the present. And uh, shouts out to ones that keep fighting the good fight uh, right now, not just only for us as a people, but for everyone as well. So we want to take time out to uh, acknowledge that before we get started. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Let's be, yes. Let's review uh, the action from the NFL Division of Playoff Round Weekend. Let's start with the Saturday games. Lakina, it was the Green Bay Packers moving on to the NFC Championship game for the second consecutive season after they defeated the Los Angeles Rams 32-18. to Aaron Rodgers had another stellar game for the, uh, the men in green and yellow. <laughs> 23 of 36 with 296 yards and two touchdowns. Aaron Jones, the running back for the Packers, 14 carries, 99 yards, and a score. And Alan Lazar came up big in a receiving department, four carries, no, sorry, four receptions, 96 yards, and a big touchdown in that fourth quarter. Lakina, the Los Angeles Rams gave it all they had, but they just didn't have enough firepower offensively to match up with the Packers. The Packers, uh, they were the better team. I really thought that the Rams could pull off an upset. It looked kind of gloomy for a while for the Packers, but they had just enough to get by the Los Angeles Rams, especially in that second half. Yeah, look, you gotta you gotta commend. Look, you you have to commend. Um, you know, the Rams were keeping it as close as as they did. I mean, I'm sure a lot of people, you know, thought that it was going to be a blowout. It wasn't. It's, they they kept it close for about a quarter and a half. But mm-hmm. like you said, I think you know the the off the talent on offense. You know, the we saw what Aaron you know Aaron Rodgers you know was. He was able to do all year. He'll, he'll probably be in the MVP of the league. And, you know, two touchdowns and almost 300 yards passing. I mean, it was it was definitely one of those things where you, you're like, okay, you know what, you saw the talent. You know, you saw why Green Bay has been so good all year. Al Lazar actually dropped the touchdown pass, like, in the third quarter that would have kind mm-hmm. of put the game away. But, you know, look, Aaron Rodgers, his credit went back to him. You know, he caught the, the sort of like, you know, the – you know, the dagger touchdown pass, if you will. So he was able to, you know, they were able to pull away in the end. And, you know, unfortunately for the Rams, I think you just not having Cooper Cup, you got to think that played a part as well. You know, the defense did have five sacks. They did, they did sack Aaron Rodgers five times. So that's why they were able to keep it close. But it's a talent on offense or probably not too, the fact that they didn't have a lot of talent on offense probably what did the Rams in the end. Yeah, you, I couldn't agree with you uh, with with you more, Lakina, as far as the Rams are concerned. Uh, taking a look at their numbers offensively, Jared Goff, who had a better game on Saturday than he did last week in their win over the Seahawks when he came in late in, in place of the injured John Wolford. Goff was 21 and 27 for 174 yards and a touchdown pass. He did look good throwing the deep ball a couple of times, but it just wasn't enough. Cam Akers, the rookie running back out of Florida State, 18 carries for 90 yards in a score. Uh, Josh Reynolds stepped up for the most receiving yards on the team with, with 65. Van Jefferson stepped up with six catches and 46 yards in a touchdown pass from, from Jared Goff. So uh, the Rams did 
did, excuse me for the um, audio, uh, the Rams did have a, a little bit more to give on offense, but it just wasn't enough. Like you said, the defense uh, actually stepped up, and I thought that Leonard Floyd would have a big game. He really, he really disappeared, in my opinion. You could tell that Aaron Donald was struggling a little bit, but I, I just don't see how the, the Rams <laughs> stayed in this game. You know, the final score, but – what made you believe if you didn't watch it that the Rams were down and out of it, but they really stayed in it. They just didn't have enough to get over that home. Yeah. Well, it was unfortunate too, because like we've been saying, they, they kept it close, but again, like I said, not having Cooper Cobb, you know, they were, you know, they were out a couple of others or some key guys too. So I think, you know, if you're the Rams, you look at the all season, maybe perhaps, maybe bring in Allen Robinson, perhaps, or Kenny Galloway, maybe. I mean, you know, that, mm-hmm. that sort of like, you know, help, help, you know, give golf that extra guy to throw to. You can never have too many of those guys to throw to. But, you know, let's talk about the, you know, the Packers. I know we be Bears fans that I know people don't want to give the Packers their due, but they've, they've done, you know, they've scored. I think they've averaged, I think, about like about 30 points in mm-hmm. most of their games in the second half of the season going into, the, you know, with the playoff game, the divisional round game this past Saturday. So they're going to be a tough out. And, you know, I we'll talk about the Tampa's New Orleans game in a minute, but in a little bit. But uh, it, it's going to be hard, especially if they have to go at Lambeau to do it. I mean, the Packers are showing you why they're the number one seed. Yeah, and it's really led by the, their offense, Aaron Rodgers. He's done more uh, this year than he did last year when Matt LaFleur, the head coach, came in because the running game was emphasized more last year than it is this year. But Rodgers has seen the field better than ever. And the, the, the defense for the Packers carried them a year ago until they faced the 49ers. This year, they don't have to rely on their defense as much. The defense actually stepped up on Saturday, second Jared Goff four times and, and having seven quarterback hits on him as well. So uh, the, the the Packers will have their work, work cut out of, uh, on them uh, for them against the Saints. We'll get to, like you said, we'll get to the Saints-Buccaneers game in just a moment. But that – that Packers defense, even though I'll, I'll still say it doesn't scare me, but they're, they're doing just enough to be competitive. And especially, you don't have to have the pressure on you, especially when you have an offense that backs you up like that. Unlike here in Chicago, mm. <laughs> you know, the defense can uh, do their thing and, and not have, have to carry the team. Well, if you look at the, the stats, and they showed the stats during the game, the, the Packers defense actually is – near like in the top, like what, 10 or 12 in a lot of categories, you know, they, mm-hmm. they sat, they sat golf four times. So look, you gotta, you gotta give them a little bit of credit here. Right. I mean, the, their defense, yeah. I mean, yeah, they don't have the names, you know, Adrian Abos is sort of a name familiar to Bears fans. Zadarius Smith is another name that's familiar to a lot of people, Jerry Alexander, but for what, you know, Darnell besides, Savage. Darnell Savage. Yeah. Besides those guys, I mean, a lot of those guys are kind of no young, no name guys. So for them to be doing what they've been doing, you know, holding the opponents down, you know, keeping, you know, keeping the offenses at bay. I think that like, like I said before that they're, I think they're still showing you that they're a pretty good defense too. We, we all know what the offense and what they can do, but their defense will show you, Hey, you know what? We're pretty good too. Yeah. They lived up to the belly on like a year ago at this time when they got smashed by the 49ers, as I mentioned, but this year they are living up to everyone's ex- expectations of being their number one team in the NFC. Like I said, next week's game against the Saints is going to be tough, but um, they're playing up to their capabilities right now. Can they do it to go to the big show? We shall see. But uh, Green Bay had an impressive performance against a very good defense in the Rams on this past Saturday afternoon. Let's move over to the Saturday night night cap, Saturday night cap, rather, uh, in the AFC Divisional Playoff. It was the Baltimore Ravens losing on the road to the Buffalo Bills 17-3. to Jared. Sorry, excuse me, Josh Allen of Buffalo, rather, 23 of 37 for 206 yards in a touchdown pass. Gus Edwards for Baltimore, look, he was one of the only bright spots for the Baltimore offense, 10 carries for 42 yards. Stephon Dix for Buffalo stepped up big in his second playoff game as a Buffalo Bill, eight, re- eight receptions, 106 yards in a touchdown. Lakina, <laughs> as I was getting ready to say before I read off those statistics, uh, th- this is kind of what uh, the ugly games that you always um, l- are looking forward to um, using air quotes for those listening exclusively on the podcast, those nine, three, six, nine games. 
this was a drag him out, sock him out contest. But that Lamar Jackson interception, along with his injury, uh, basically uh, turned that game around for Buffalo and, and basically put, put it away. Yeah, it, it, it's – yeah. I, you know, that win was whipping in Buffalo. I mean, it didn't snow, mm-hmm. but that, that win was, you know, whipping like crazy. And it, I kind of feel like, you know, look, the, the, the Bills did just enough to win. I mean, Taron Johnson had that 100-yard uh, INT the other way. I mean, you, you thought that maybe mm-hmm. that they were going to score to perhaps tie the game. That, that, interception yeah. hap- that interception happens, and, you know, Justin Tucker missed two field goals, but that win was whipping. So that was mm-hmm. very under, uncharacteristic of him. And but yeah, also, Buffalo's kicker missed one too. Yeah, yeah, he did. Yeah, Bass. Yeah, he did. Um, yeah, that win was really, you know, monstrous. You know, we should know because we live really in the windy city. But I mean, there was a lot of struggles. I mean, I think the the Ravens should have kept running the ball. I feel like I think they kind mm-hmm. of abandoned the run because that actually helped them initially so I'm kind of surprised that they abandoned the run it seemed and also to not having that extra wide receiver hint hint you know maybe maybe, <laughs> maybe that's something that they didn't do during the, during the offseason like I said Allen Robinson and perhaps Kenny Galloway I mean have either one of those guys I mean Hollywood Brown was a, a non-factor unfortunately so you know it was definitely you know sort of one of those days also too when Lamar Jackson you know went out with that concussion Tyler Huntley the rookie from Utah you know, came in, you know, he did what he could, but it, it just wasn't enough. And you can tell the, you know, they weren't prepared and, but you got, you got to give Buffalo their props. I mean, that defense, you know, slow the, the Ravens, you know, down. We talked about that Johnson interception you know, among others, you know, Trey, Trey Evans, you know, had six tackles. Michael Hyde also had six tackles and Matt, Matt Milano also had six tackles. You know, did, you know Tra- 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 Davis White did his thing too. So that defense, mm-hmm. You know, look, we've been praising that defense all that defense all year, and also Stephon Diggs. I mean, look how much have, getting Diggs has helped Josh Allen and his confidence. So, yeah, yes. they, they totally deserve to win that game. I don't know if you heard uh, uh, heard of uh, uh, Stephon Diggs' comments to Michelle Tafoya after the game. They have him and Josh Allen uh, interviewed after the game. He was like, he's worked his uh, <laughs> his tail <laughs> off. Uh, you could tell those two really uh, click with, with each other and they uh, know each other well. It, 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 you can have great chemistry when you're winning, but you can tell that Stefan Diggs and Josh Allen both, both uh, you know, are comfortable with one another. So I, I just don't think that they could be stopped when, when they're hitting all cylinders. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, absolutely. When they're, when they're clicking, they're, they're hard to beat. And, you know, the fact that the way the, the way Allen was looking at, you know, Stephon Diggs, I mean, we, you know, why can't we have that in Chicago? Why can't we have, you know, somebody, you know, you know have our oil, the quarterback looking at their wide receiver, you know, with the, with the you know, affection and appreciation? I mean, you, you want to you, – you, you, you feel – pretty good if you're a Buffalo fan right now they go back to the AFC title game for the first time I think since those if you remember those Jim Kelly Thurman Thomas Bruce mm-hmm. Smith Andre Reed teams from back in the day so I mean I, I look I mean like I said I'm, I'm happy for the, I'm happy for the Buffalo fans I'm happy for Buffalo too that like you mentioned the King they were known as the lovable losers from the early 90s I'm, I'm glad to that people are finally starting to uh, see that they weren't just losers. Uh, they were actually pretty good teams. And, of course, um, their city has been crapped on in their whole franchise for since we were teenagers, basically. So not to age ourselves on this show, but uh, that's a very good fr- <laughs> that's a f- very good franchise. And they had, have had bad luck until the last couple of years j- drafting Josh Allen, getting that defense together. Now they have some – Offensive weapons to go along with him, including Stefan Dix, who his first year there with the team. So, uh, head coach Sean McDermott deserves a lot of credit, and they deserve all the success that they've been uh, receiving for the last couple of years. Absolutely, and they they've been kind of been sort of on the come up, and you know we'll we'll see we'll see mm-hmm. what they do we'll see what they do do on Sunday because I think look well we won't do our predictions until of course our Friday's pod, but. Mm-hmm. I think they may have a chance here, but mm, I'm not, like I said, I'm not going to say anything. But I, for what I saw from the, you know, we'll talk about the Chiefs game, the Browns game, in a, you know, in, in just a minute or two. But I, I don't know. They may have a chance here. And you know, as for the Ravens, I mean, look, you have to perhaps maybe invest in an O line, maybe perhaps invest in a center 
dirty all season is addition yeah. to to get a wide receiver so that way you won't have to depend on Lamar Jackson they won't have to do it by himself so much but you know that's a another story for another podcast I guess <laughs> yeah speaking of Lamar Jackson I, I forgot who tweeted this uh when Hundley came into the ball game replacing the injured uh, Lamar Jackson, someone tweeted out and, and said, Mitchell Trubisky will be the perfect backup to Lamar Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> I, I forgot who tweeted it. I was like, hmm. Oh, I really? get where they're coming from. Backup, yeah. But obviously he's not a, not a starter. But as a backup, Mm, I don't know. <laughs> no, I don't. I don't know either. I mean, I, that's, I, I don't know. I like. I don't know who tweeted that, but I'm. I'm like, okay, that 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 person is. Uh, I, I know. I understand where they were getting that, but uh, mm-hmm. remember, remember, like I like I said, he's a rookie, so he'll. <clears throat> Plus, you, you don't. You look. You're a rookie. You don't expect to be going out there during a playoff game. I mean, come on now. Give the give the kid a little bit of <laughs> give the kid a little bit of leeway here. Come on now. You're listening to Second City Sports along with Lakina McGee. I am Sydney Brown. We review the NFL Division of Playoff Round games from the weekend. We are done with the Saturday games. Let's go to the Sunday games. Uh, it was the Kansas City Chiefs defeating the Cleveland Browns 22 to 17. Patrick Mahomes 21 of 30 for 255 yards and a touchdown. He left the game in the third quarter with a concussion. He's in concussion protocol right now as we speak. Uh, Daryl Williams. For Kansas City, carried the ball 13 times with 78 yards, including some big runs in the second half. We'll get to the those play calls in just a minute. Tyreek Hill had eight catches for 110 yards. Lakina Cleveland had their opportunities, especially in that first half when Higgins, I understood what he was trying to do, stretching that ball out to the goal line, but you have to be smart right there. Just keep the ball. And you would have had first and golf on the one. Now, Gene Serator, who I cannot stand, that CBS rules analyst, he actually made a great point that uh, Sorensen, the linebacker for Kansas City, who hit him and knocked the ball out of bounds into the end zone, it was actually actual helmet to helmet contact, but that play could not be reviewed. So, and that in a penalty flag was not thrown. So, I, I thought he brought up a great point. But if you're Higgins, just keep the ball in your hands. I know he was trying to do a stretch, but you weren't close enough that you was going to get the call. So that, that, is, that was just an unfortunate uh, bounce and an unfortunate break for Cleveland. That that gap could have been closed, closed in closer going into halftime instead of trailing by double digits. Well, and, and you hate the rule too, that if you fumble in the end zone and in that, in that form, and then it goes out, you know, it goes out uh, and it goes out to the end so that's an automatic touchdown for the other team i don't look that rule's been around a long time look if you want to change the rule in the off season hey go ahead and do that but that rule, that rule's been around for a long time as long as i can remember so a silly rule aside i, I mean look you know the browns had their opportunities to win that game especially when mahomes went out and henny came in mm-hmm. which, I, which which i find funny that people are forget that he was actually still in the league i mean he's been in kansas city for about three or four years now and actually has a super bowl ring from last year so i think people will kind yeah. of give him a little bit of credit <laughs> even though matt moore was the second stringer <laughs> yeah exactly so well he, he well he started in week 17 so that was a that was a, yeah. I found that pretty funny that that people actually brought that up. But look, I mean, you get you look, you give Andy Andy Reid credit for the play calling, especially once Hetty got in there. Look, they only needed a half a yard to seal the game. The fact that they actually went with the with the jet sweep and actually passed it to Hill to get the three or four yards they needed, mm-hmm. you know, you got to give him credit for that. And look, he came in Cleveland. You know, no one thought they would get this far. They won eleven wins, but. I mean, there's going to be a lot of pressure on them to perhaps maybe go you'll go a step further next season. So we'll see. They're going to, you know, for what I saw from their schedule, they're going to have a very tough schedule next year. So we'll, we'll see what happens in, in that front. But uh, but look, I mean, maybe they maybe they should have ran the ball more when you know not that they should have when they did. And look, the, the defense for the Chiefs, you know, look, Tyron Tyron Matthew had an interception. Mm-hmm. So I mean that that. I mean, look. I mean, the, the Chiefs' defense got to give them credit for doing what they need to they need to do, especially when once Mahomes was out. So, well. The... Yeah, taking a look at the numbers for the Cleveland Browns: Baker Mayfield, twenty-three of thirty-seven for two hundred and four yards, a touchdown, and an interception, as you mentioned. 
from uh, from Tyron Matthew. The running game was a problem for Cleveland, as you mentioned. Nick Chubb, only 13 carries for 69 yards. Kareem Hunt, the former chief, did score a touchdown, but he only had six carries for, for 32 yards. In the receiving department with Sean Higgins, as the name I just mentioned a moment ago, five catches for 88 yards. But that big turnover towards the end of that first half was a, a real killer for for the Browns. David Njoku, the tight end, four catches, 59 yards. Donovan Peoples-Jones, the rookie wide receiver, had that big catch in the first half, only one catch for 23 yards. And Jarvis Landry, seven catches for 20 yards. The Cleveland offense could have done more. Like you said, Lakina, they should have taken advantage of Patrick Mahomes' injury, but <laughs> it just didn't happen. Kansas City had enough to win. Let's give uh, Cleveland some credit defensively. Yes, they only had a, a sack and three quarterback hits, but Miles Garrett played his ball, even though you could tell he was injured at the time, chasing around Patrick Mahomes. Uh, the, that Cleveland defense is not as bad as people think, but they just didn't have enough to stop the high-powered offense from Kansas City. Yeah, the, well, yeah, they just did, and you know, Henny showing some wheels in that that last that that last series. I mean, I know people were shocked mm. by that, but look, I look, I saw him do it a couple of times when he was at Michigan, so it wasn't. That, yeah. that's not, I mean, that that's not you know that 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 wasn't weird that he was able to show some wheels there. But like you said, Sid, I mean, the defense you know should have been a little bit more aggressive, especially mm. once once Mahomes got you know got you know got injured and you got banged up with the concussion so and unfortunately they didn't do that I mean the Travis Kelsey also has some big catches too Nico Harmon had mm-hmm. Nico Harmon had some big catches so look the fact that the fact that the offense was able to kind of step up the way they did you know despite Holmes not being out there I think this is sort of a testament to not only the team but the coaching Yes, uh, like you said Andy Reid is one of the best coaches in the game finally he has a Super Bowl ring from a year ago but we talk about this all the time, and I bring this up. Bill Belichick, the coach of the Patriots, always I call him Belichick. <laughs> Situational football, you have to know what to do, when to do it in every situation. And you can see that throughout that Kansas City roster. And like you mentioned, like Canada, the, the last two players of the game of that game to basically seal it, seal it up, Chad Henning uh, running for that, for that first down. He didn't get it, but he came close on that third down play. Cleveland was not expected. And then, of course, that fourth down catch by Tyreek Hill, sliding in bounds, staying in bounds to run out the clock. So that's situational football that we talk about all the time on this show. And Kansas City executed those two plays to perfection on Sunday. Well, in that particular play, too, I think that everyone was brought up that that was a, that was a play that the Bears were trying to run, you know, last week against the, the Saints. But, well, remember, folks, too, I mean, know your personnel. The Chiefs have the yes. personnel to, to pull that off. The Bears don't right now. So, <laughs> there you go. I lo- yeah, highlighting some uh, offensive stats from Kansas City. Darrell Williams, 13 carries for 78 yards. Patrick Mahomes, he had a touchdown run off three carries for 14 yards. Chad Henney, as I mentioned, two carries for 12 yards. And that was that, that big third down play toward the end of the game. And also Chad Henney relieved Patrick Mahomes in that third quarter, six of eight in an in exception for 66 yards. Let's focus in on that Kansas City defense. Like, they only had uh, one quarterback sack and three quarterback hurries, but I think – the way I looked at that game on Sunday, it was more of Cleveland not taking advantage than Kansas City's uh, performance. I don't know how you saw it, but Cleveland left some points on, uh, on the field yesterday, especially as we mentioned toward the end of that first half. Oh, I, I, oh, I agree. I think some of the play calling, though, you kind of felt it was a little bit questionable. I mean, mm-hmm. they're, they're, kind, they're kind of weak in the middle, so you, you wonder why, like I, like I said, I mean, why didn't they run the ball more with Hunt and Chubb? I mean, look, Hunt played for the Chiefs for a little bit, so I'm sure he knows the they're no, he knows their defense is game pretty well. So I'm, 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 I'm thinking that, eh, you know what, mm, they, they did leave a lot of points on the board. I mean, you know, everyone says that you know, that win was there for the Browns at, for the takings. But it didn't happen. That's why I say again, we're not doing our we're not doing our predictions until Friday. But <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised if Buffalo pulls off pulls off the ups upset. I'm quoting here, but you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you listen. You're listening to Second City Sports Zoom style, along with Lakina McGee. I am Cindy Browns. We continue to review 
the NFL Division playoff action from the weekend. Our last game from Sunday night, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers and Tom Brady will be moving on to the NFC Championship game for the first time since 2002. They defeated Drew Brees and the New Orleans Saints 30-20. Tom Brady had 18 passes out of 33 attempts for 199, 199 yards and two touchdown passes. Alvin Kamara had 18 carries for 85 yards for the Saints. Traquan Smith had a big game for the New Orleans Saints in the receiving department, three catches for 85 yards and two touchdowns. Lakina is just this simple. Tampa Bay uh, took advantage of the New Orleans Saints turnovers, which was four to be exact. Three of those picks were thrown by Drew Brees. It was an ugly fault first half, but Tampa Bay uh, took over in that second half. You could tell that New Orleans just couldn't really get it going. We saw, look, we saw that game against the Bears. You know, we saw how long it took for them to kind of get their offense going. And the same mm-hmm. thing happened here. I mean, look, it was sort of like a game of chess. I mean, you know, the Saints took an early lead, but then, you know, Tampa Bay came back and it was sort of, you know, for a little bit it was back and forth, but, you know, the Bucks were able to kick it into gear and those three interceptions by Drew Brees. And then you saw that bomb that Winston, Jameis Winston threw you know, unfortunately, we saw that he can't, you know, Breeze can't throw those deep passes anymore. And unfortunately, exactly. that, that came back to bite him in the butt because he would throw short. But unfortunately, you know, boom, White, White caught the interception for the, the Bucks. Um, mm-hmm. which, you know, Mike Edwards, you know, boom, you know, he caught another, uh, another uh, short pass that was on <laughs> right Breeze. And also, too, Sean Mur- Murphy Bunton, that, that, you know, that sort of, that intercept sort of started this sort of spiral for the Bucks you know, to the, in the right direction, you know, he threw it, you know, got it to deep into their, you know, the Bucks, you know, into the Saints territory and the Bucks were able to score after that. So you gotta, you gotta give credit to the Bucks defense. I mean, Alante David made some big plays, Antoine Whitfield Jr., the rookie, you know, made some, you know, big tackles as well. Look, Brady, mm-hmm. look, you know, Brady did what, you know, what Brady usually does during the playoffs. I mean, you know, and unfortunately, you're surprised at why didn't they run the ball more? The Saints did. I mean, I know, I know Murray was out because you know he was a healthy scratch. So it was Taysom Hill. Taysom Hill. So you wonder, well, that decision. You got to wonder, well, that that you know that kind of came back to bite you know Sean Payton and the Saints in the butt. Yes, uh, like you say, Andy Reid is one of the best coaches in the game. The same story has been over these last few years. You 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 almost get to the top of the mountain, you just can't. What we talked about before with the Tampa Bay defense, they they created four turnovers, including three interceptions from Drew Brees. I like the fact that the Buccaneers turned um, the uh, the turnovers into points, including the one uh, turnover by a uh, by uh, I forget his name, but uh, it, it was it was set up by the it was concluded by that Evans touchdown uh, late in that second half. Tampa Bay's defense didn't sack Drew Brees, but they had three quarterback hits. And like you mentioned, Lakina, Drew Brees, uh, we know that all season, especially the last couple of years, he couldn't throw the football deep. And Tampa Bay took advantage of that. They had a, a bunch of coverage, disguise coverages that fooled Drew Brees. You know, it's Drew Brees, they couldn't, he couldn't throw the ball um, not just down the field, but in the middle of the field as much as they usually do. And, and, and for an example, the Jerry Cook play on, well, he, it was part of one of the four turnovers that the Tampa Bay defense created. Jerry Cook had the catch, but he fumbled the football in that, in that defense of secondary for the Bucks was very aggressive. And I thought they really had a great performance on Sunday. Yeah, it was a, probably their best performance of the season, that Tampa defense, because yeah. like you said, they were able to take advantage of the fact that, you know, Breeze can't throw the ball deep. And like you said, they just disguised the coverage and they were able to make those big plays. I mean, Sean Murphy Bunton, like I said, that first intercept, that first interception they helped. Yeah, that's his name. Yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. that, that, that set up that score for them. And I mean, you know, like I said, Winfield, you know, Antoine Winfield Jr. made some uh, big tackles. Avante David, you know, mm-hmm. De- Devin White, who also had an interception too. So look, you got to give the, the defense for the Bucks credit. I mean, but as I, like I said earlier, and I remember you probably didn't hear, hear me said, but, uh, you know, why didn't Kamara get the ball more? Why, in, you know, you know, Taysom Hill was a healthy scratch. So you wonder not having him there and not having the Tavis Murray there. You got to wonder why, 
you know, did that come back to bite him? That kind of came back to bite him in the butt in the end. Yeah, looking at the New Orleans Saints stats, Alvin Kamara had 18 carries for 85 yards. His longest run was 17. Ty Montgomery, the backup, had four carries for 14 yards. In the receiving department, Trey Quan Smith was the only one that really showed up for the Saints. He had two touchdown catches off three receptions for 85 yards, including, as you mentioned, that that um, Jameis Winston touchdown pass. His only uh, pass of the season goes for a touchdown. Go figure that. Jerry Cook, as I talked about just a second ago, five catches for 28 yards, including that fumble. Emmanuel Sanders had six catches for 48 yards. And Michael Thomas was a no, is a was a non-factor with zero, zero, and zero. So <laughs> that, that Saints offense was MIA yesterday, even though it was a struggle, as I mentioned, in that first half. That second half, uh, uh, that offense collapsed. And like you said, Lakina, not having Taysom Hill in there especially, you could tell that Saints offense was very different. Yeah, it, completely different offense. And you wonder you know, if this is the last you know, game for Drew Brees, you know, what a tough way for him to go out. I mean, the way he was mm-hmm. kind of blowing kisses, because there were, there were a few hundred people there. There were about seven or 800 folks there. And mm-hmm. you could kind of tell, you know, you saw – you saw him and uh, Brady with his, you know, with your know, Breeze's kids after the game, and you can kind of see the shock on mm-hmm. you know, his two oldest sons' faces. You're like, wait a minute, damn! I didn't know <laughs> someone could throw a ball that far, and you know he's older than his, you know, they're older than Brady's older than their dad, so he can still do, you know, throw the deep ball. So <laughs> that was crazy. But uh, it was like, yeah, what a what a sad way for you know for Breeze to go out. This is truly is his last game. Yeah, it's a sad way to go out, but unfortunately, not all athletes get to go out on their own terms, so uh, he has to uh, live with that. It indeed was his last game. Uh, I, you, you can tell what kind of world we are living in uh, for the moment when Breeze and Brady hugged after the game. In a normal setting, Lakina, there have been all local and national media from around the world uh, um, uh, caving in on on us uh, on the 50 yard line and both of them probably wouldn't have had any room to hug but since we are still in um, uh, in this uh, COVID world we're not post COVID yet but right. we're still in uh, in proto- protocol right now in quarantine and things along that line uh, they were, they had more than enough room enough room to embrace each other at the 50 yard line uh, during that game on Sunday so. You can tell things have changed for the moment. Hopefully things will get back to normal next year. But with that being said, it was still a cool moment to see those guys embrace each other out of respect and love for each other and for the game. Well, yeah, you saw, you saw the Fox cameras were there, the NFL films cameras were there. So, mm-hmm. you know, they, they, they yeah, that was it. <laughs> yeah, that was pretty much it. I mean, they're, you know, unfortunately, like you said, said we couldn't, that that was basically the only ones. But, but in essence, I think mm-hmm. that was good because it, it felt more like an intimate moment, though. Yeah. So they didn't have all those cameras. To- <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> you're listening to Second City Sports. Mm-hmm. And now, yeah, we discussed the National Football League. Lakina, while we have a couple minutes left, uh, stories that we're reading and hearing coming out of Houston, Texas, Deshaun Watson. Uh, I think we touched on it on our last couple of episodes that he wasn't happy that he wasn't included in the process for a GM. As of, of this recording, Eric Bieniemy, the offensive coordinator of the Kansas City Chiefs, is being interviewed today by the Houston Texans. I'll just say it like this, Lakina. I feel sorry for Eric Bieniemy. Does he deserve a head coach's job? Yes. But even though he's being interviewed by the Houston Texans, if I'm Eric Bieniemy, if you want to coach Deshaun Watson, which I'm assuming that he does, mm-hmm. I think I, that's probably why he took this interview. Right. But if he does not want to coach Deshaun Watson, why – Waste your time and waste the Houston Texas time. And I'm tying this all in to say this. If you're Deshaun Watson, if you really feel that unhappy, you should request a trade. And on the other side, Eric Bieniemy, who deserves the opportunity, I don't, on a personal note, I do, want, do not want him to go in with the save the franchise situation. Then when you build it up to a certain level, then you get the boot. And you you don't get the credit that you fully deserve. Go ask Mike Singletary about that. Of course, Jim Harbaugh took his players to the Super Bowl back in 2012. <laughs> and there's countless other examples as well. John Gruden. I I, I for me, 
it sounds like to me if Eric Bieniemy doesn't get this Houston Texans job and hopefully has the opportunity to coach Deshaun Watson, it looks like he's going to be locked out again for the second year in a row. He should have the best situation for him. He should choose the best situation, obviously, for him to be a head coach, not just take any job just because it doesn't seem like he's going in that route, thank goodness. But it seems like to me with him being interviewed by the Texans today, uh, if he's not given the opportunity to coach Deshaun Watson, that's if he that's what he wants to do, then time is being wasted here. I'm just hoping I'm conveying that message correctly. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it it's it's sort of real interesting, right? I mean, you saw all the reports, all the comments, you know, he made, and you know, I'm talking about Watson, and especially mm-hmm. if it turns out that Watson might be gone by the time get if you do get the job. If you're Eric Bieniemy, like, would I even want to take the job at this point? Especially since mm-hmm. you know Watson has been very, you know, you know, vocal kind of behind the scenes. I actually been like vocal, you know, you know, it try to be very subtle with it, but you can kind of read between the lines. I wouldn't want to take the job if you're Eric Bieniemy. I mean, you're good. Look, you'll have your choice of jobs. I mean, you know, look, the Chargers just just hired their new coach, Brandon Staley, and. You know, we, we, we mentioned Robert Sala from, you know, from who went from the 49ers to the Jets. I mean, it looks like the Lions might have found, might find their coach as well. I mean, you like, no, I mean, uh, you might as well just stay as an OC for another year. I mean, especially if Watson, you know, if Watson has shown that he's not happy and especially with the direction that they're going, I mean, this is not the kind of situation you want to be, you know, you want to come into. And hopefully that uh, Deshaun Watson is being included in this process. And hopefully, and from some of the stuff that I read and heard, that he wanted the Texans to interview the enemy. They did in the beginning their interview, interview with him right now as we record. I just hope that they may get their wish. I'm assuming that, like I said, assuming that the enemy wants to coach Deshaun Watson, if that's the case, if you're the Texans, you should go ahead and, uh, and give the enemy the job if he wants it. And Deshaun Watson make him happy because let's be honest, He's the franchise right now. I know J.J. Wall is the face of it, but he's been injured for the last few years. He's been perhaps their best defensive player for that young franchise, and they may have to come during this offseason because of injuries and age or what have you. So, But hopefully that things will turn around for, for Deshaun Watson and for the Houston franchise, but the, the Houston franchise at least probably have a, a mud on their faces right now. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And this is not the situation. We, if you saw Randall Cobb's tweet, he had that cool little gift of the guy walking in that everything's on fire. And that's what kind of mm-hmm. looks like at this point. But, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens. I mean, you know, if, if Watson does end up getting traded, that's a, that's a big if at this point. You know, my, people are saying Miami might be a, a destination for him. You know, I know some people said Chicago, but if you're Deshaun Watson, why the heck would you want to come here after – the guy who initially, you know, who, you know, was sort of in charge of, you know, picking you, he didn't want, he didn't even want to come in, really? That, that, that's kind of absurd. Um, exactly. And, uh, okay, what's a couple other places I heard? I mentioned like somebody else. I, I think, what else, uh, other places? I think there were like, there were a couple of other places that, I, you know, that escaped my mind. But, I mean, I'm sure, look, Watson will have his, he has a full no trades. He's one of the few players to have, in the NFL to have a full no trade. So mm-hmm. he'll probably have a say on, where he wants to go, but this will be very interesting because once the coach is named, whoever it is, and if Deshaun Watts is not happy, then look, they already got ruined. Look, he, you know, James Harden is our, you know, already showed that he's not very happy where he was in Houston, but again, a different situation. Mm-hmm. He didn't let himself go. At least, you know, Watson played hard. We'll get to Mr. Harden and, you know, his shenanigans in a little bit when we talk about the NBA, but I mean, if you're look, we're, this is still there's still a lot of question marks here. If you're Deshaun Watson and the to Texans too. Yeah, if you're Deshaun Watson, are one of the only few stars in the NFL that can um, use your your power for for good. And uh, and if you you're not happy, you, you can use your leverage to your uh, the best of your ability. And he has the opportunity to do that if he if he's not happy there. Now. I, <laughs> I just want to remind Mr. Watson, uh, you know, being consulted by management, it, it has its perks, but just because you want something doesn't mean you're handed, you're going to, uh, everything's going to go your way. I, I think he's smart enough to understand that, but but I, I 
I commend him for you know uh, evaluating the situation and see see what he could do with his power. You know, players from the old school couldn't do this, and now what? But the LeBron James and what he's done throughout his uh, playing career, you know, is open up doors for athletes, not just in basketball, but all your other sports as well. And now you've seen it with football players over the last few years. Like, we're not just going to sit here and take a year. We, we want to honor our contract, but uh, there, there are some loopholes there. And I can see using my star and my leverage and my power to move to another place. I will do that. No, oh, yeah, absolutely. So we'll. We'll see. I mean, look, you know, if we reconvene and, you know, they, the Texas found their coach and maybe, you know, maybe Deshaun Watson will be happy, but then again, he might not be. So we'll, we'll, we'll have, to just have to wait and see because it's going to get very interesting down there in Houston. Yes, it will be. One quick question for you, Lakeem, before we close out this segment. Do you know who, who do you think that – who you, do you think is going to get that Philadelphia job? Because I think management has made it clear – if you take this job, you have to take on Carson Wentz and quote unquote fix it him. Right now, I don't have any idea. Yeah, I, I, look, if you want that job, that especially with those sort of you know kind of an ultimate, if you will, look, you have to take Carson yeah. Wentz in that contract. I'm not, I'm not. Maybe a young up and coming coach probably you know may be able to fix him, but at, at this point, I mean, I'd rather have Jalen Hurts. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> if you're Josh McDaniels, who had cold feet a couple of years ago, that's why he didn't take the Indianapolis job. Of course, four million dollars from the Kraft family uh, helped out with that too. Come on back, in which he did. Mm -hmm. If you're Josh McDaniels, do you really want that job? If you're Eric Bieniemy, even though he's being uh, interviewed by the Texans at this moment, if you're Eric Bieniemy, do you really want that job? If you're an experienced guy, do you really want that job? Oh no, I. I you're being told to fix Carson Wentz. Yeah. <laughs> yes, himself personally, but <laughs> you know, I I don't see an experienced coach taking that job. Oh, well, like I said, it's probably going to be a young up and comer, and who's probably say, "Hey, I can look, I, hey, I, I could like maybe like a Cliff, Cliff King, Kingsbury type, like, hey, I could fix this guy." And you know, probably not. If you're an experienced guy, if you've been around the block, you're like, uh, -uh I don't want to, mm -mm, no, especially. <laughs> And, that, and that's, that's not a good look for the for the Eagles to basically say, hey, you know what, you have to fix Carson Wentz if you take this job. I'm sure somebody will, but you're gonna you're turning away mm -hmm. a lot of prime candidates. Yeah, you are, but like like we always say, you have to leave no stone unturned, and you have to find the best candidates out there. But uh, I just feel not just feel, but see in this situation, you really walk into the lion's den. And you really have to have a tall pass and turn that situation around quickly because Carson Wentz, as we know, signed that big contract before the start of last season, and that's a big salary cap him if you cut him or trade him. So you're kind of stuck in a catch-22 there. Yeah, absolutely. So it'll be interesting to see what the Eagles do. <laughs> One segment now, another segment to go. We'll talk about James Harden as – Again, I mentioned I did watch the majority of that game live via my computer. And we also talk about the Chicago Bulls, and we'll have another couple of fun topics for you as well. You're listening to Second City Sports Zoom style. Zoom style? Welcome back to Second City Sports Zoom style. Zoom style? Along with Lakina McGee, I am. Cindy Brown, this is our show. You can follow yours truly on the Twitter and the IG at CK80. Once again, at CK80, that's S I D K I D 80. That's S I D K I D 80. You can follow me at Kina McGee on Twitter and at Kina Oscar McGee on the IG. You can follow this podcast, Second City Sports, along with our other podcast programming from War Media by simply going to our website at www.wearigoradio.com. You can also Download this podcast along with the other podcast programming by simply typing in War on Anchor. That's W-A-R-R -R on Anchor on all uh, podcasts, down, download podcast platforms, including the iHeartRadio app. We're also on YouTube at War Media. That's W-A-R-R -R Media. You can not only listen to us, but watch us do our thing. Look at that. All right. Like, share, subscribe, and tell your friends. Yes. Yes.
Look, Kenny, you kick off the second segment. I, I believe that the Chicago Bulls are starting to turn around uh, their play a little bit. I was encouraged to see what I saw on Sunday in their victory over the Dallas Mavericks. That Friday, that Friday game against the Oklahoma City Thunder bothered me, but they rebounded quickly with their win over Dallas on Sunday. Both games they played hard and tough on the road. Well, well, look, we've been saying this for the last, you know, couple of weeks, right? I mean, look, you know, you're, you're going to get a fight from this team. And, yeah, that, yeah, that, that loss against OKC when they were up by, like, they like 18 and they, you know, they, you know, coughed up the lead late in the, late in the fourth. But, mm-hmm. look, they could have, you know, crawled into a hole and just, you know, in the field position, just, you know, just you know, close themselves. But they didn't. They bounced back. They did what they were supposed to do. Laurie Markinson had a nice, you know, had a nice, you know, nice performance, you know, 29 points leading, 20 points, I should say. Uh, and also, too, uh, you know, leading the way, for 29 points, I should say, leading the way for the Bulls. Uh, Thaddeus Young had 15 points off the bench. And, mm-hmm. you know, look, they they look, they look, did what they had to do. I mean, you know, Zach Levine had, only had 10 points, but he had 10 assists. I mean, Margaret had a, a double-double. Uh, Wendell Carter Jr. had 12 points. I mean, and, you know, mm-hmm. Garrett Tipple, who I think a lot of people were sort of looked at his signing and thought, uh, okay, we're scratching their heads like, oh, okay. But he had 21 off the bench. He's sort of the facilitator. He's sort of that, that, that sort of like mm-hmm. the leader there. So to kind of keep them, those guys in check. So, and making those guys feel confident. And you know what? I think you're feeling, you got, you got to feel encouraged if you're a Bulls fan. I know, I know the OKC <laughs> game was, you know, uh, yeah, you, 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 oh, but you know what? They, they bounce back, and that's what you want to see. A couple of things I took away from the Bulls play this weekend. One, uh, unlike on Friday night, the Bulls bench extra responded against the Dallas Mavericks. And they, at one point, they had a 38-9 to nine advantage as far as bench points were concerned. So you encourage that more people besides Otto Porter Jr. and – What's the other guy? And Daniel, Daniel Gaffer, my guy. Uh, hey. Yeah, you were co- encouraged that more than those two players uh, are bringing energy off your bench. That was one encouraging thing. Number two, Laurie Marketing, who I've been hard on, like most Bulls fans have been hard on ever since he was drafted a couple years ago. It looks like he could play within that system. He had, he had under 20 points on Friday, but as you mentioned on Sunday in that victory over Dallas at Dallas, he had 29 points. He had a couple of nice uh, dunks, especially that one LU play from Zach Levine. Uh, it was it was pretty nice there. So it looks like Laurie Marketing is going to take him a few games to get his legs back, but it looks like he, he wants to insert himself right away. We saw bits and pieces of that against the OKC Thunder last Friday, but he really came into his form on Sunday against Dallas. Look, I'm look like we've been saying. I mean, this team fought. You know, they fought to hang on to that win. And look, yes, the Mavericks. Yes, Dallas was left. You know, was shorthanded with you know some, some guys. You know, being you know, left out due to COVID issues. But look, Luca. Mm-hmm. They were able. Look, Luca did what he did. You know, scored 36. But they were kind of they kept mm-hmm. the rest of that team in check. You know, Porzingis had 20. But like you said, like we've been saying. I mean. They were able to keep a lot of those guys in check. Their their defense looked really good for the for, you know for the first time this season. So that that yeah. and also too you know only thirteen turnovers that was always an issue for for them so far this year for the Bulls. Yes. So yes, they, they've been look that that's a good number if you're if you're a Bulls fan you gotta be feeling pretty good. Um, they 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 play the Rockets tonight and. Look, I think they may have a chance to win this game because they might be you know the, the Rockets might be a little shorthanded too. So they can take it. Take they can probably take full advantage of that. So if look, if you're a Bulls fan, the the stock the stock's going up for them. It is, and, and I'll go back to the bench play from Sunday's game against Dallas. Ryan Archidiakono, who was one of the starting point guards a year ago, he had the four points in 17 minutes of action. But you could tell that his presence was felt on the floor, on the floor, especially on the defensive end, grabbing four rebounds. He also dished out five assists. Garrett Temple, as you mentioned, chipped in with 21 points. Clearly his best game in the Bulls uniform by far. My, my guy Daniel Gaffer, after not playing on Friday, he played on Sunday, grabbing three rebounds and scoring seven points on 13 minutes of action. And Thaddeus Young, which he can, he, he's probably uh, a trade 
deadline candidate once again for the second year in a row. He scored 15 points off of 19 minutes of action on Sunday against Dallas. You like what you see from him so far. Otto Porter Jr. chipped in with 14 points off of 7-10 shooting. So you are you should be encouraged if you're a Bulls fan and you need some energy coming off that bench because looking at the performance on Sunday, Zach Levine, as you mentioned, only had 10 points on 1-8 shooting after scoring 35 on Friday. Kobe White in 25 minutes of action, over five shooting, no points in a in the plus minus of minus three. So I, I'm not worried about Kobe White. I'm not sure some people are going to go in and say, well, Kobe White is he's just starting to develop bad habits and all this and that in the third. I think he's still going to be fine. Remember, he's still in his second season in the NBA. You're going to have nights like this, but the the key is, especially for a team like this, how do you bounce back and will you be consistent? Uh, playing in 48 minutes, as you mentioned, Lakina, keeping up the good fight, and you have to be encouraged by this Bulls team. If like like what happened on Sunday, Zach Levine didn't score that much. Kobe White was shut out. Who else is going to step in and stepped up? Everybody else did that on Sunday, uh, and that's why they won at Dallas, despite what what Luca did. Yeah, but that was great to see. I mean, look, mm-hmm. the, look, yo, know, maybe a couple of years ago, if that were the case, if you know, Kobe White didn't score and Zach Levine struggled. That would have been a – the Bulls would have been blown out of the building. But now, you know, Doc, mm-hmm. is, step, Doc is stepping up, stepped up. Garrett Temple stepped up off the bench. Arch Diacono, you know, was a facilitator. Also, also two Wendell Carter Jr. You know, was a facilitator too. So, you got to be feeling pretty good if you're, if you're a Bulls fan. I mean, things are looking up. Yes, things are looking up, and uh, they're, I believe, five and eight on the season, and so they have a chance to turn it around. I don't have the schedule in front of me yet. You know, as you mentioned, they uh, they played the Rockets on Monday, but you have a chance to build on this momentum. Hopefully, you can string some uh, a nice uh, uh, string some wins together, and let's see if you can get a, a nice winning streak going. Because as we mentioned before, that the bottom half of that Eastern Conference is very murky and is very bunched up. I'm not saying this team is going to the playoffs just yet. They still have some ways to go, but you have to be encouraged the way they've been playing for the last couple of weeks. Stock's definitely rising for the Bulls, so you got to be feeling pretty good about that. Let's go to the NBA abroad. Lakina, I was watching this game doing football <laughs> via my computer. <laughs> James Harden. <laughs> James Harden and the Brooklyn Nets have faced the Orlando Magic. And they they defeated the Magic uh, by under 10 points. James Harden became the first NBA player to make to score a triple double in his uh, new team debut, scoring 30, 32 points. Kevin Durant had 42 points. Of course, Kyrie Irving is not back yet. Hopefully, as of this podcast, uh, they played the Milwaukee Bucks on Martin Luther King Day on Monday. Hopefully, he let's see if he returns by then. But those two guys look good in um. In their debut together, of course, they played uh, with each other at OKC between 2009-2012. Looking at that game on Saturday, James Harden was the primary point guard for that team. team. Of course, that's not going to be the case if and when Kyrie Irving returns. But you can tell that James Harden was was looking to insert himself early. He did that scoring-wise, but he also chipped in with 12 assists. For me, Harden... He has a, his reputation to rebuild right now, especially PR-wise, uh, given what everything he's done these last couple weeks recently. And, of course, when it comes to playoffs, he has his reputation to uh, repair there as well, but we wait for that come playoff time. But uh, these two players look good together on the court. My question is, and I think we brought it up on our last podcast, what will Brooklyn's bench look like? Because – uh, the way that they played on Saturday, they did some nice things, but will that be your final roster? Because I guarantee you some aging veterans, including Thaddeus Young here in Chicago, if they get bought out or uh, if they're not traded there, there's going to be some aging veterans looking for that championship ring to come knocking on their door. And then Sean Marks, the GM over there with the Nets, I'm knocking on his door and asking, uh, can I play for the league minimum? <laughs> can you, can I, do you have a spot on on that roster for me? I'd like to help that team win a championship. Well, and also let, let's start with Harden first. I mean, like really? Okay, yeah, this is sort. Yeah, now you decide to show up. Okay, uh, you have a triple double your first game <laughs> out in the Nets uniform. Already then, 
Um, but yeah, I mean, look, they don't have a bench right now. Like you said, they basically traded like half their bench to <laughs> to Houston and to Indiana. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, also, you know, our uh, be- our best wishes to Karis Levert. You know, they found a mass in his um in his kidney and they yeah. probably would not have found it had it not, had it not done the physical to, you know, to complete that trade. So our, our best wishes, who knows what would have happened. So our best to him, but yeah, I mean, you know, Thaddeus Young, I mean, do they, the only thing is that do you have anything for the Nets? You know, you, you, you traded all your draft, your first round draft picks. I mean, do you have anything there to, for the bulls to take? I'm sure, I'm sure uh, our tourist credit Smith and Mark Eversley, I think they're going to want maybe something, you know, from them, but mm-hmm. you trade all, you trade all your draft picks for the next three or four years. So, but they, there might be some, you know, to look out for, especially once you get to the close to the trade deadline. I mean, look, as far as Harden's concerned, I mean, it looks like, you know, for some of the various reports, um, I read that uh, Kyrie Irving, he's still working on his conditioning. So he's going to miss tonight's game against Milwaukee. So he probably will be likely to be back either Wednesday or Friday in Cleveland, you know, one of his, you know, his former team. So that's something to look out for there. I, I mean, look, if you're the Nets right now, <laughs> look, I mean, if you're the Nets right now, I mean, you, you've won, you've won three in a row that, that look, that's great. You're, you're back at five, you're back over mm-hmm. 500, but you know, right now you don't have a bench. <laughs> so it'll be interesting to see what the, what they do and what, you know, what direction and the Nets decide to go. I mean, it'll, it'll, it'll look, I mean, if you're a Nets fan, you got to be encouraged by the performance by Harden, but it, it kind of, kind of scratch and claw your way to get to that point. So. Yeah. As we've mentioned before, I think we mentioned this on our last uh, episode, uh, it's going to take time for chemistry and habits to develop because all three of these guys were out for alpha dogs on their uh, previous teams. And so you had to have, uh, with all those superstars coming together, you got to know each other's tendencies, uh, know each other's habits. So that takes time. And as we mentioned just now, uh, that bench is probably not going to be the same by the time playoff time is concerned, especially with aging veterans. If they have room on their roster, not going to know Sean Marcus door to come to see if they could play for that team to help them win a championship. So uh, it, it's going to take some time, but in a short time, you, you like to see the Nets uh, getting off to that uh, that that starting to start winning some ball games here. Now, a couple of the teams that I was impressed with over the weekend, the Detroit Pistons, uh, they beat the Miami Heat 120 to 100. Of course, the Miami Heat now, uh, as of right now, four and seven. The Pistons exploded in the second half. Shout out Derrick Rose, Chicago's very, very own. Uh, the Pistons shot the lights out in that second half, especially from three, but the Miami Heat, uh, they are not playing good right now. Uh, defensively, it's not there. Uh, Scoring-wise, uh, they're inconsistent. But the, the one team we talked about in our last podcast, Lakina, and that was the Toronto Raptors. They rebounded on Saturday, defeating the Charlotte Hornets 116-113. to 113. They are now 4-8 and eight on the season. We talked about it last week, Lakina. They lost a, a couple of games on the road at Portland at Golden State on the last second attempts by Pascal Siakam. But ever since then, they've turned it around uh, on the current – they're now on the current two-game winning streak. Yeah, and, and I'm, I'm happy for that. Hopefully this will be the start of a nice little winning streak there for the Raptors because that team – They need good. it right now. Yeah, I mean, that team's, that team's too good to not be, in, you know, be at the top, you know, at the, in, in the top eight of the, the Eastern Conference right now. We'll see if they can, you know, get it together. The Heat, I mean, look, our our, our, our buddy Alana Tashauer, I'm sure she's not very happy <laughs> because of, you know, what's been transpired, what has transpired with the, <laughs> with the Heat. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, not at all. And there's just, just inconsistencies, like we've been saying. I mean, it doesn't look good for them. Orlando, they lost five in a row. You know, they're, they're starting to kind of come back to earth a, a bit. Um, and Bolts is out too, so you gotta think that that's playing a part as well. Um, Milwaukee, you know, they've won four in a row. I mean, they, mm-hmm. they they're looking pretty good. You know, Giannis and the gang. Um, you know, the Celtics they lost a couple of days ago, but you know what? They don't. They won seven of the last ten, so you know they, they gotta be feeling pretty good. They lost to the Knicks last night. I mean, it look look. I mean, if you're a Knicks fan, you gotta be feeling encouraged at this point. You know, they're they're actually up uh, in their they're in today's game. Oh, you know, they actually won their game against Orlando. So now, hence the Orlando's now lost five in a row. So, but yeah, I mean, if, if you're the if you're the Bulls, I mean, you may not get that get the eight spot, but you could probably make a play to get into that play in uh, that play in uh, series. 
You're listening to Second City Sports along with Lakina McGee. I am Cindy Brown as we talk Chicago Bulls in the NBA. A couple of other games that stood out to me over the weekend from Sunday. The Sacramento Kings, they are now 5-9 uh, and nine on the year. The New Orleans Pelicans went in there to beat them on Sunday, 128-123. to 123. Zion Williamson is coming into his own, and he did that with their victory with 31.6 rebounds and two assists. De'Aaron Fox. I don't know if he's going to stay there long term, but he, he scored 43 points and, and dished out 13. And it says the first time a Kings point guard has done that since 1973, Nate Archibald, and they were the Cincinnati Royals. Ooh, wow. Going way, going the way back machine with that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I saw that stat this morning. This morning, I was like, whoa, that has been a long time since a Kings point guard has done that. My goodness. Yeah. Of it course, has been the a while. Los Angeles. <laughs> Yeah, the Los Angeles Clippers get their second straight 30-point victory, defeating the Indiana Pacers 129-96. to Paul George had a big game. Marcus Morris Sr. had a good game for the Clippers with scoring 20 points. Indiana has struggled for the uh, last couple of games. Lakina, they lost at Sacramento. They lose here at Harris Lever, who they acquired with. It was part of that that trade last week with the James Harden. He, uh, obviously, he's not playing. Vito Oliva is no longer on their roster. Uh, I'm not saying this is going to be a free fall for the Pacers. They still have a good enough record, but uh, they're at a crossroads right now. Well, like, like I mentioned, I mean, you know, he's you know, Levert's going to be out for a little bit. You know, hopefully, you know, it's nothing serious. I mean, the roster is there, right? You know, you know, Drew Holiday. Mm-hmm. Uh, Sabonis. I mean, the, the roster is there. Miles but, Turner. Yeah, Miles Turner. Yo, know, he's still. Uh, people forget he's still around. Yes, he is. Um, so I mean, uh, it, it'll be interesting what they do here because not not having Levert there, I think that's gonna be a problem for them. So hopefully mm-hmm. they won't go into a complete free fall, but we'll we'll see. I mean, look, the NBA changes at, 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 at you know like that. So I'm, I'm hoping that this doesn't start as a free fall, but. One game that really stuck out to me was the Jazz and the Nuggets. That, mm-hmm. you know, Jazz, the Jazz have won five in a row. You know, you got to give give them credit. I mean. No one's talking about them right now. But I think if you're the Jazz, you probably like it that way. <laughs> I think yeah, you're okay. Yeah, you're yeah. okay with that. You're okay with that. I mean, look. <laughs> I mean, look, Robert had a double-double. Mike Conley, you know, had 14 points. Donovan Mitchell had uh, 18. So, they looked really good. They Like I said, they won five in a row. Denver, uh, they've been coming up and down. Jamal Murray, you know, Jokic, but nobody else is helping them. So that's a problem. Yeah. That's a problem if you're a Nuggets fan. You thought that maybe they could build off of, you know, getting going to going to the uh, the Western Conference Finals, but sorry about that. <laughs> you thought that maybe they could have built on, you know, at, when they got to the Western Conference Finals, but that hasn't been the case. Yeah, their roster is slightly different from a year ago. Of course, uh, Jeremy Grant's no longer on that team. I think that's a huge that was a huge loss. Yeah. But you know, besides Jokic, Jamal Murray, my guy, he has to step it up again and start turning things around. Paul Millsap, what, what does he have left in his tank? We don't know. And Michael Porter Jr., uh, if and when he's healthy, can he step up and provide some scoring? Like he did in the bubble last season, right. we shall see. But Denver, you know, your run game out under 500 as of this recording at six and seven. You you can still turn it around. No, outside of the Lakers, no one has really blown me away, and no and and no one has really taken over this Western Conference. I know the Clippers starting to get it together, but they don't scare you as of yet. It, it's still early. We're barely one month into the season. Yeah, I mean, you know, the Lakers yeah. are doing what the Lakers have been doing <laughs> all last year. I mean, look, they they've won five in a row. They got a they got a, a good one against the the, the you know they host uh, Steph and the Warriors tonight. That should be a fun one there. That mm-hmm. I believe that that's a TNT game. Yes, it is. So yes, it yeah, is. Mm-hmm. Actually, that should be a fun one there. We'll definitely be watching that game. That should be a fun one. Um, we've talked about Utah. Like I said, I think they like the fact that no one's talking about them. I think they're okay with that. Um, even yeah. though even though they lost a couple of days, couple of nights ago, I think the Suns still look really good at this point. Portland, Portland's, you know, are they starting to kind of get it together and creep up? So is San Antonio. <laughs> Dallas has lost a couple in a row. So has the Warriors. The Grizzlies, you know, they they've looked really good. You know, winning four in a row. We talked about them. So 
I don't know. I mean, like you said, we're not even a month. Yeah, John Moran is back. They had a big yeah. victory on Saturday against the Sixers. And that's that's huge. You know, the fact that you know, thankfully that that injury, the ankle injury, wasn't serious. Thank goodness. You know, he only missed a couple mm -hmm. of weeks, and he you know had a nice nice little uh, you know debut back. Um, but yeah, so I think the bot that bottom half of the Western Conference doesn't really scare me that much. I don't know how. How about you? How do you feel about that that bottom half of that Western Conference? It doesn't scare me either. But like I was saying, we're barely one month. The season, so you still have time. So hopefully, these uh, postponed. We'll get to that issue in just a second. But like, like I mentioned, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, it's early, so teams are trying to figure out themselves, uh, figure out their rotation, uh, who's going to step up, and so uh, it, it's going to be a challenge. But uh, it, it should be fun. Hopefully, if things don't fall too much off a of track. Now, as I just mentioned a second ago, the NBA as of this recording, has 14 games that has been postponed due to COVID. And I know Monday's uh, Miami Pistons game was moved from the afternoon to the evening. Mm -hmm. uh, Lakina, I think I said this on air if I didn't. I know it's kind of a mood point now, but I'll say it anyway. I, the NBA knew that it was going to have to deal with this issue. They, they, could, they could control everything. Uh, last summer, because they were in the bubble and the players didn't go anywhere, they all stayed within that complex down there in Orlando. That's not the case this season. They knew that, uh, you know, those that follow this show and follow the sport, you knew this kind of stuff was going to happen. Now, I, now I still don't think it's going to be as bad as people think it's going to be. I don't want to hear as much outrage as we heard when the NFL season uh, kicked off. Oh, we're not going to finish. I'm not going to mention that ignorant person who said that, but I – they knew they were, uh, they were going to deal with this issue because we're it's still in the second wave right now, even though the vaccines are being distributed to the higher-ups first in, in the importance of people in terms of our health care workers. I know the 65, our seniors 65 and older are next within the next week or so. But the NBA knew they were going to deal with this issue. Do I still think it's going to be as bad as people think? I don't think so. I know the NBA has has implemented, uh, implemented some rules within the last week or so to have tight, tighter restrictions. You can't really stop this virus completely. You can only hope to contain it, <laughs> not mm -hmm. to be funny about it, but you can only do so much. But I think the NBA, just like the NFL, it seems like they're going to get away with it now. It looks like the NHL the same way, even though the Dallas Stars haven't kicked off their season yet. We'll get into hockey in just a moment, but uh, the NBA is just going to have to power their way through this thing. Even though it's only 14 postponed so far, I'm not going to say the NBA should be proud, but it's not as bad as they probably thought it was going to be. Now, you thought things were going to run smoothly without any cancellations. You're crazy, but you really had to have any games canceled. You just had to have some games moved around. And that's going to be the, the issue. That's going to be the key here, I should say, Sid, because we've already got we've already had like multiple games, you know, postponed and pushed back, you know, due to mm -hmm. due to COVID and issues. You know, Philly and OKC was postponed yesterday due to you know mm -hmm. Philly's been having COVID issues. Cleveland and Washington, both those games have been postponed. Mm -hmm. You know, it's concluded to the one that was supposed to have been tonight. You know, actually, it's supposed to have been playing right now. Both those games have been mm -hmm. postponed due to the Wizards and their COVID issues. So. But look, I mean, look, we're in the second wave. You know, yeah, another apparently there's another strain that that's now here in the states. So yes, the vaccines are coming up. But look, it's like we've been saying, it's going to take some months before it's widely available to people. Mm -hmm. Look, I, look, I'm, I'm, look, I don't think it's going to get to the point where, oh my God, they're going to have to shut down the season. But let, let's slow down here. Let's take it one day at a time. Mm -hmm. I think the NBA knew this. They knew that they probably were not going to be able to control everything. You know, they they've implemented some stuff like, look, you can't go to you know, to big gatherings, you're going to be monitored mm -hmm. more and, and such. So, you know, I don't think it's going to get to that point. I mean, look, the Bulls have had some games postponed. You know, they had their Celtics game postponed last week due to uh, COVID issues. So, for the, mm -hmm. with the Celtics. So, we'll get, to the, we'll get to the college ranks, too, because it seems to be, be more rampant there. But, I mean, look, look, like you said, I mean, they can only do so much to help contain this virus. Look, we're still, like I said, we were kind of at the 30 on the other end. When it comes to COVID, we're almost mm -hmm. there. We just got to soldier through and just be cautious. And look, I know Dave Lillard's not happy that he feels like they're going to have to report everything to the league. But look, we're trying to, they're trying to keep you guys safe. So I, I think, you know, people can sh to just sort of, you know, just take the precautions and then just keep doing it until, you know, the vaccine is widely distributed. 
And just to, uh, to make note, these games that are being postponed will be made up during the second half of the season. So there could be another uh, factor right there as uh, these teams get ready for the drive towards the playoffs. Uh, how many games you're going to play in, in so many days and how will the NBA schedule those games? We'll worry about that part down the road. But getting back to the players, Lakina, uh, they knew what they were getting into coming to the season. They knew that just like the players in other sports, you're going to be under huge restrictions. I can understand not the league not uh, telling them what to what to do and what not to do in their personal lives, but what they do off the court is going to affect what they do on the court, especially in, in the stage that we're in right now. Well, also too, you know, we're in a state that's still pretty much restricted. So, yes, it's not. It's not. Yes, it's not as bad as it was. You know, months ago when all this started, mm-hmm. where everything was shut down. But you still got some limited you know, restrictions. I mean, yes, you're seeing in some in some spots and some arenas that you see a few fans, maybe a little pockets of fans, especially down in yeah. down in uh, in Texas and Oklahoma and OKC, but you know in, in Miami in, as well. Yeah, especially in Miami and Orlando. Um look you're still you're still dealing with not a lot of crowds, especially here in Chicago. There's nobody there. There's yeah. nobody don't forget Utah they have fifteen hundred fans for each game. They, yeah, and I believe, I think, oh, crap, I think it was another, other states. I think North, I think North, I think Charlotte may, they may be living some people. I think it's like five, 500, 600 people. I'm not, I'm not quite sure if that's the, if that's the case. I might be, I might. I think it's New Orleans. New Orleans, it's New yeah. Orleans and then Memphis. Yeah, New Orleans, New Orleans and, Memphis. and Memphis. Yeah, that figure. Yeah, I figure it was in one of those southern uh, cities. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, I mean, look, we're still kind of in that way. We're slowly, like I said, we're slowly getting back mm-hmm. to normal. But folks, we still got a ways to go. Yeah, and also don't forget about Indianapolis. They opened it up to a few fans now. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. They just started. So, I think they're hot. Yep. Yeah, so we'll we'll see what happens with the NBA. Now let's head over to college basketball. Let's start locally. Lakina, uh, Saturday's game was not good for the Fighting Illini. Uh, they lose their second straight in the row in the Big Ten to number twenty-one, the Ohio State Buckeyes, eighty-seven, eighty-one. Ayo, as I call it, Ayo does, does boom, boom, has scored 22 points, dished out five assists, grabbed four rebounds. A.J. Liddell for Ohio State had a big game with 26.7 rebounds and uh, an assist. Lakina, the final line night, they're almost just like the Bulls, but the opposite. When, you, when it comes to down the stretch, they don't know what to do. And, of course, in, in, you can say in – all games that there's maybe a, a questionable call or two that the refs could have called or not called or, and what have you. But sometimes you just got to play through, through these things. And head coach Brad Underwood has some – he has some work to do with his young men. I think they're still going to be a good – they're still going to be a good team. They're going to be fine. But they, this is just some adversity that uh, these young men you will just have to uh, push through. And it all starts with your head coach. Also, the fact that the Big Ten is so deep, I think that's another yes. reason. I mean, look, that's that Ohio State team is really good. I mean, look, mm-hmm. they're in the top twenty-five for a reason. They're eleven and three, so they're not they're no slouches. You know, EJ Liddell is one of their best players, so I'm not surprised because I actually watched some of that game. So I was not surprised that he was able to make the big shots that they needed to win that game, and they made some defensive mm-hmm. stops too. Ohio State did. Yeah, you, yeah, there you kind of there were some calls, a couple calls. You kind of you know you kind of were kind of questionable that went against Illinois, but you got to play through it, and this is something that Brett Underwood has to sort of teach you know his guys to sort of play well down the stretch because like you said we talked about that with the Bulls they seem to have the opposite mm-hmm. problem the Illini does but but I think also it's a testament to how deep uh how deep the Big Ten is and we're going to talk about that because uh another one of your teams uh uh said um uh, Michigan um yeah they got <laughs> all the yeah look all this buildup that we gave Michigan in the last pod Mm-hmm. They got the same thing done to them by Minnesota. <laughs> so, yep, seventy-five fifty-seven was the final score of that game. Isaiah Livers, um, he had eleven points, nine rebounds, and two assists for Michigan. But Liam Robbins had a big game for the Golden Gophers, uh, left there with twenty-two points and eight rebounds. Uh, I watched a little bit of that Michigan. They, we, we all know they can shoot the ball, but their their interior defense and their inside game. It's not as good. It's been like that for the uh, last two years. 
And look, I mean, look, you know who's coaching Minnesota? I mean, Richard Pertino. Yeah, I think he, I think he, mm-hmm. he, he taught that from his dad. You know, the, the interior defense, and he was able to kind of, uh, they were able to sort of, you know, expose that. You know, Marcus Carr had seventeen, yeah. had seventeen points for uh, Minnesota as well. Look, that Minnesota team is really good. Like it's, like I said, it just shows you how much depth the Big Ten has. And Minnesota actually mm-hmm. has the somewhat easiest schedule left, while Michigan has kind of like the heart. Near, near the top of the hardest schedule left in the Big Ten, the rest of the Big Ten Conference, uh, the rest of their schedule. So that's going to be a free-for-all as to, you know, who's going to win that Big Ten Conference because Iowa had a big win against Northwestern. It wasn't as bad, yeah. as, I, it wasn't as, bad as I thought it would be. I thought it was going to be like 30 or 40 points, but, you know, Northwestern actually, I'm actually <laughs> close for Northwestern. So, uh, yay, there's, a, there's an accomplishment there. So you got to be feeling pretty good. Um, but, yeah, I mean, that, that Big Ten Conference is so loaded and – you know, it's going to be a, it, it's going to, it's going to be interesting to see who ends up winning that conference. Yeah. Like you say, you have some good teams, including Iowa and Mi- Michigan still good, even though they took an L on Saturday. I still believe Illinois can make a run, but they got to turn it around quickly. Going back to that Iowa game yesterday, I did check out maybe a minute or two of it. Luke Garza, if not, if he's not the big 10 player of the year, he's going to be right in that conversation, 17 points and 10 rebounds in that in that victory on Sunday. That's all that needs to be said about that game. Yeah, <laughs> that's all you need to that, – that's, yeah, that's really – that's basically all you have to say. Um, Houston had a nice win. You know, they're, they, they, you know, they came back after being off a couple of weeks. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, M- Miami, I mean, the Miami Hoops team, you know, we also – we talked about the football team, but their Hoops team's actually been playing very well lately. Um, you know, pulled you know, pull off upset against Louisville on Saturday, so – that's a, you know, Jim Laurinaga is doing a great job, you know, keeping that, that, that program afloat. Virginia had a nice win, scoring 85 points. Yay, it scored 85 points against Clemson. <laughs> um, look, Tennessee looked really good. It's looking really good. Um, look, there's a big game tonight. You got Baylor and Kansas. You know, Baylor all fresh off their big win on the road in Lubbock against Texas Tech. That's good. That should be a good one there over in um in Waco so that that's that I can't wait for that one gonna be watching that game via uh the television <laughs> but yeah <laughs> but yeah so what 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 about you what what impressed you this weekend in hoop college hoops yeah it's really the the biz the big disappointments in in Illinois and Michigan in Michigan but I think both those teams were turning around I'm more confident in Michigan is going to do it but Illinois has too much talent on their roster. Like I said, head coach Brad Underwood has a, a huge task in front of him. I think he can get that situation turned around because that team is too talented, talented to have a record that it has right now. But I believe they'll get it together. They better get it together fast because we're in the middle of this month in January. You, you head towards February down the home stretch before those conference tournaments, and you, we're going to see what they're made of. Shit. Yeah, it should be a fun one. Um, like a, this should be should be a very fun one there. Um, you know, unfortunately, we you know, I know people were looking for the forward to this matchup, um, Notre Dame and Howard. Unfortunately, that that game's been canceled because you know some you know, COVID issues going on over at the mm-hmm. Howard program. Um, Gus Johnson, who is a Howard grad, was supposed to have been doing the game for Fox Sports. Unfortunately, you know that 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 I'm sure that's a bummer for him that he, he does get a chance to um call that mm-hmm. game. Um, let's see who else. Oh, uh, Utah State, you know, got, got a nice win against San Diego State in the whack. So, um, yeah, so, um, that that's look, I mean, we're kind of we're in mid January, like you said, say we got about like six weeks left in this you know, in the season. So, this is sort of like kind of playing for position here. If you're if you're like one of those those top teams, those top conferences, that you're kind of finding your way there. Yeah, that's what it's all about, and this is this is really March Madness right now. So before we get to those conference tournaments, like you said, the gigantic for positioning of who's going to play the best, who's going to be consistent as we head down the last few weeks of conference play. Before we get up out of here, Lakina, I'll just mention quickly as we turn our attention to hockey. It was a great contest between Pittsburgh and Washington on Sunday. Uh, it was on NBC with Pittsburgh winning, but I'll I'll say this. Uh, about the Blackhawks. I know they're 0-3. That was an ugly loss at Florida on Sunday. They should have beaten that ball club, but we have a bunch of young guys, especially um, a bunch of young defensemen that they're basically learning on the job. I'm not going to say they're going to have the worst working in the league. I don't see that. Maybe that's just me, but 
uh, on a couple of those goals on Sunday that Florida scored, including the one by Keith Diano, he scored his 100th, 100th career goal. Your defensemen are out of position. When that happens, when your goalie has to be pulled out of his net, to <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's just not good. Now, the, like I said, the scoring is not going to be the problem for the Hawks. It's just their defense and their goaltending. Now, Colin Delia didn't have that, that bad of a game. It wasn't his fault that they lost uh, uh, against Florida. It was basically their defenseman being out of position. Now, you can understand Tampa Bay in those first couple of games, they have a better roster. I get it. But the, the game on Sunday against Florida, they should have won. Yeah. I, they're eventually they're going to win their first game. I don't think it was going to be as bad as people make it out to be, but they're not as good as people want them to be either. So there, there's my hockey minute for the Blackhawks. <laughs> it's going to be interesting to watch to see what happens, who's going to take that goalie job. Jeremy Carlton, their head coach, uh, this is the time for him to really earn his money with that extension that you see before the season uh, kicked off last week. It's going to be interesting, though, because I, I feel as though, well, like you said, I don't think they're terrible like other people are saying, but I don't think they're middle of the pack either. They're definitely not in the top tier, so it'll be interesting to see. Mm-hmm. But, then it, but then again, you know, but then again, you know what? I mean, look, they get, look, Carlton's got a contract extension, so he is going to be around for, for a little bit, so. Maybe the Sunday that Florida scores this week. Yeah, so uh, it'll be interesting to see what they what they do here because I I kind of feel like where where do the hawk what do the hawks do where do they go from here and you know I'm I'm, I'm hoping that we get a little bit of a fight from them the and season. and that that because you know their their yeah. def- their defense is not good and look I mean Tampa's looked impressive so far um I know the Capitals lost but you know that they, they've been impressive so is the fly so had the Flyers the Flyers look pretty good too um, Toronto's looked good so far so. You know, still very early on in the season, but the way the things are kind of realigning I, I, for the for you know because the way they have it all set up this year, I mean, the Hawks, yeah. and, the Hawks and the Red Wings are actually in the same conference, same division, so yay, just like old times. But you know, the Detroit's <laughs> kind of been having you know issues too, so you can really that, that makes you feel a little bit better. <laughs> yeah, they'll probably be our first victory when they play Detroit. But uh, quickly, as I mentioned this team earlier, the Dallas Stars will open up their season in a couple of days. Uh, they had issues with COVID. They were supposed to start along with everybody else last week, but they currently have 17 players uh, with yeah. COVID-19. They're, they're in quarantine right now. So as we talked about with the NBA, as we talked about with the NFL throughout the season, um, they're going to have to deal with these issues as well. Of course, all the Canadian teams are playing in Canada this year. We thought they were going to play in the United States, but that's not the case. Of course, the, the Toronto Raptors basketball team is playing in Tampa here in the States for this season. But uh, Dallas is, well, is, is the only team that hasn't played the game yet in the NHL. They will in a couple of days. But hopefully the, the, the NHL, they'll have to just power through this thing as well. Yeah, they're gonna have to soldier on just like the other the other leagues. I mean, look, we saw, look, we look, we saw the NFL has have their issues. The NBA is going through their issues. Like you said, I mean, unfortunately, you know, right now with Dallas, they haven't been able to play yet because they've had COVID issues. So this might be the case again for some of these teams. We may have another couple <laughs> other teams are gonna be suffering through this. So you just got they just if you're a league, you just gotta soldier on and just hopefully, you know, you won't have to deal with stoppages. But that that's a that's something that they got to worry about. Yeah, before we head out, what are you looking forward to this week? The Kansas Baylor game coming up tonight. That's a that's a that's a fun one there. Um, looking forward to see watching some more NHL and also to NBA. You know, there are a couple of matchups. You know, I'm looking forward to, of course, Warriors and Lakers. That'll be tonight as well, and a couple other matchups that I see that will be coming up this week too. Before we convene on Friday, what about you? Uh, the same, uh, w- w- especially with the basketball, the, the, the Chicago Bulls, they're a must. Uh, I'm not, I'm not going to say they're not must watch TV. They are, but let's see if they can continue this momentum, perhaps start a nice winning streak. I'm looking forward to that other NBA action as well. Um, I'm not going to say I'm looking forward to football yet because they don't play until next week. So we'll right. do our previews on our next uh, podcast. So just looking forward to watching some, hopefully some great basketball, both college and pro this week. Absolutely. And on that note, you can follow me at Keena McGee on Twitter and at Keena McGee on the IG. 
You can follow yours truly, Sid the Kid, on Twitter in the Instagram at SidKid80. Once again, at SidKid80. That's S I D K I D 80. That's S I D K I D 80. And you can go to our website, weareregalradio.com. That's W E A R E R E G A L radio.com for all for all of our articles, podcasts, and other fun features there as well. You can follow our podcast at, well, at War Media. Sorry, from all the podcasts from the War Media Group. By simply searching for War on Anger on all podcast platforms, including the iHeartRadio app, just type in that search engine box, W-A-R-R on Anchor. We're also on YouTube at War Media. Once again, at W-A-R-R Media on the tube. You can not only listen to us, but watch us do our thing. You see our beautiful, lovely faces. Like, share, <laughs> like, share. That should be like, a new thing from now on. Yeah, exactly. Like, like. <laughs> Get a big, beautiful smile. Yeah, exactly. Like, share, subscribe, and tell your friends. Yes. So, yes. oh my God, Sid, oh, that went by really quick. So, but look, guys, yes. Noah, please be safe out there and keep fighting the good fight because, look, we need to kind of get together and have these conversations. Yeah, there's good, there's going to be uncomfortable, but we got to have them because the only way we'll, we'll be able to power through and have a, you know, a future. All right, for Lakina, I am Sydney. This has been Sega City Sports Zoom style. We'll talk to you in our next episode. Take care. Wear your mask, as Lakina always says. Practice social distancing. And until next time, holla!